Hello, Dr. Mike, Dr. Hamilton, Dr. Haug. Uh, we are gonna um, end today with this great panel. I have a lot of questions. So uh, Dr. Hamilton, somebody asked, they were saying they're not having psychosis, but they have very different memory, you know, memory recollection, recollections than their spouse. Uh, what, what is that? Is that anxiety? Is that uh, a cognition issue? What's, what's going on? Well, um, that probably, well, not knowing a lot of the details, I would say that is more likely than not a cognitive issue. So the frontal lobes of your brain are responsible for understanding with the help of the memory systems, the source of information. And sometimes what happens uh, is you may be going along, having a conversation, uh, a day later you have another conversation. It's, it's got a similar context, possibly similar people, maybe a similar situation. And the two bits of information crisscross. So it's not at all uh, uncommon for individuals with Parkinson's to have what we call source memory problems. The information is accurate. It's just switched. So it may feel like you said X when in reality your sister said X um, or this event occurred on this vacation when reality, the event occurred on a different vacation. And so typically what I'll say is we want, we want to see if it's that sort of situation before we go to potentially the idea that it's psychosis um, or a hallucination, it's usually more in line with the, uh, with the cognitive piece of Parkinson's. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Dr. Haug, uh, somebody asked, somebody said that they recently read that medications for overactive bladder were not recommended for people with Parkinson's. Is that a thing? What, what can you talk to about that? Uh, good question. Uh, I would also reiterate now that we're kind of in the panel portion, uh, if you would like to see all of us at the same time, you can go to the upper right corner and there's a speaker view or the other option Valerie. is, uh, gallery view. So if you want to be able to see all of us all the time and see us nodding along to the good advice of our colleagues, then uh, you can click that button. Uh, so yeah, the issue with overactive bladder medications, there are some that are better than others. Some of the bladder medications, particularly oxybutynin, has more so-called anticholinergic effects. And Dr. Hamilton was talking about the acetylcholine pathways that are involved in memory. Uh, and so oxybutynin in particular can sometimes cause or exacerbate cognitive issues. There are also a minority of people with Parkinson's that have kind of a underactive bladder, uh, a neurogenic bladder it sometimes is caused. And the bladder medications that are typically used for overactive bladder don't work in that situation. There is a different medication. Uh, but if it's kind of getting to this level of involvement, then it's usually appropriate to get a urologist kind of involved in your care team. And there are some urodynamic tests, kind of urination tests that they can do to help sort this out and talk about treatment options. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mike, somebody said, I struggle with dystonia. I'm unable to walk the distances that I used to. Are there any specific stretches that can help me with dystonia so I can walk and exercise more? It depends. So that's unfortunately the answer. So, so with dystonia, general activity can often play a role in reducing some of the symptoms. And maybe some of that's just you get more circulation. Maybe your body better processes your medication. Um, often when folks that I see in therapy or in group exercise classes have more pronounced dystonia, they'll work more specifically with their movement disorder specialist or with their neurologist to either change their medication or perhaps explore things like uh, Botox to certain areas. Um, so I guess the question then becomes, is it true dystonia or not? If it's not, um, you could certainly stretch and uh, depending on which muscle group it is, you know, often it's like the plantar flexors, like your calf, uh, gastroxoleus combo, the, the muscles on the, the back of the low leg. 
um, in which case you could certainly look up plantar, like so if, if this is your foot, you know, if you're pointing, that's plantar flexion. If you're pulling the toes back towards you, that's dorsiflexion. If it's a plantar flexor problem, you can find an abundance of stretches online to do for that. A lot of them just involve like a runner would do, uh, pressing against a wall, stepping a leg back, and heck, I'll just show you. Um, so you'd, you'd stand close to a wall and you'd step the tight leg back. And if you keep the knee locked out and the hips forward and you sink the hips, that tends to target more of the gastroc, the calf, calf muscle. Uh, but often what's neglected is the soleus, which is the, the hunk of meat below that, where to get that, you just take a half step up from your gastroc stretch and then bend the knee a little bit and sink. And so hopefully that's helpful. Uh, there are a lot of ways you can find stretching videos online too and that kind of thing. But, but the bigger question is, is it true dystonia or is it muscle tightness and rigidity? And if activity helps uh, and if stretching helps, it's probably more related to the latter. If it's, uh, if it's true dystonia, it's better to approach that through medical management with your care team. Great. Um, Dr. Howe, can you actually, uh, for those of them that are not super familiar with dystonia, can you talk a little bit about what it is and how it shows up? Mm -hmm. So dystonia is a symptom that some people with Parkinson's get that leads to a sustained involuntary muscle contraction, often of two muscles that work against each other. So if you have contraction of both your biceps and your triceps, then you end up with kind of a tight arm here. Uh, that's not the most commonly affected area in Parkinson's, but it's easier to show than my socks on this camera. Uh, probably the most commonly affected area for dystonia among people with Parkinson's is the foot, where the foot t tends to kind of rotate in and people end up walking on the outside edge of their foot. And that is something that sometimes occurs with medication fluctuations. Uh, sometimes certain medications can be used specifically for dystonia and, and for cramps. Uh, and as Dr. Mike mentioned, sometimes injections of the muscle relaxant Botox into certain leg muscles can help with that issue. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hamilton, do you recommend that all people with Parkinson's get their own full neuropsychological exam? Um, and then, you know, how often, uh, somebody had mentioned that they, they got an exam before their DBS, but they've never had anything after that. Uh, what, what's sort of your process? Let's pretend somebody uh, is recently diagnosed. Is this something that you want them to come in early? Do you want them to wait? What are some signs for them to come in? It's a great question. So uh, neuropsych, uh, neuropsych evaluations are typically ordered by your medical provider. Um, usually you would go to your neurologist, um, mention that you might be having some difficulties with your memory or your your executive functions, or just having some more struggles at home that seem unusual, um, maybe a bit more than what you're seeing in your friends. Um, and then um, your neurologist would typically do a, um, sorry, would typically do a, um, uh, a brief workup to determine whether there might be a medical mm -hmm. cause for those problems. Uh, perhaps you're having a urinary tract infection or perhaps um, your Parkinson's medications are out of whack. Um, and if that didn't help, then they would refer to a neuropsychologist um, who would then run a more comprehensive battery of tests. Um, and these would include memory tests and attention tests and cognitive processing speed tests and so forth. Um, the key is, in, in the older version of neuropsychology, those tests used to take, we, we would give really long batteries. And I don't like those kinds of batteries because I feel like at some point you, you're only testing fatigue. And all of us would get tired if we had to sit someplace for four hours and concentrate and, and do these sorts of things. So the type of tests that I do usually take about two hours, shorter if I need, or longer if it's complicated. And then we, we are able to see where the strengths and weaknesses are and provide that information back to your neurology team. 
to determine, yes, this does look like it's a, it's a mild cognitive problem related to Parkinson's disease, or gosh, this actually feels a little bit more like depression or anxiety. So I find a neuropsychological evaluation very helpful if the underlying cause of the problem is not clear to your physicians. Um, and, if, and if it would be helpful to use those, those tests and understand the strengths and weaknesses to develop a care plan. After which point, um, I don't always recommend follow-up. Once we know what's happening, I then usually will recommend maybe every six months having an individual living with Parkinson's and their care and their care partner come in and we just talk about where they are. Um, you know, are there any new troubles had that have kicked up? What, you know, what, what's going on so that I can help them problem solve. The only time I would really recommend a second follow-up neuropsych is if, if something drastic has changed, if there's been a decline that I didn't expect to have happen, or if there are other you know, medical, legal, financial reasons that another evaluation would need to be done. Um, as for DBS, we always do a neuropsych evaluation in San Diego before DBS to determine whether, that, whether you're a good candidate um, for, the, for the process. And in individuals who seem to have had a cognitive change following DBS, we will do a follow-up eval too, but we don't necessarily do it. Okay, great, thank you. Dr. Mike, uh, somebody asked, how do you incorporate exercise when cognition and spatial perception declines? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, the general rule is simplify. So, so for example, one reason I love Tai Chi is uh, it's very meditative, it's low impact. There are a lot of reasons I love Tai Chi, okay? But, uh, but any martial arts training I love to teach because you can break down a technique. For example, here's the hand motion from a Tai Chi technique called parting the wild horse's mane. You got one hand at the belly button, another hand below the chin, and you get to work on uh, harmony of hand movements and coordination. Um, and if, if that's too much or if cognition is an issue uh, with visual cueing and with auditory cueing, you could teach one hand at a time, just doing that motion over and over and over. And then as that motor program strengthens or becomes easier, um, you can then add to it. Uh, and, and to some degree, it depends on, you know, how far um, in, in terms of the spectrum of, of what's available for cognitive function, how, how much has been lost. For example, I used to see a lady who uh, has dementia and for years we did Tai Chi together and she could still mirror and follow and it was wonderful. And that's also helpful for the visual spatial component because your eyes are following your hand movements. Um, however, at some point in time, she could no longer really follow. Uh, but because we've got a very good relationship and because I've got a good relationship with her family, um, you know, now I can still give her tactile cues where I lightly start the movement with her wrists. You know, I'm touching her hands and, and guiding her wrists. And because she's had so long practicing those movement patterns, she's able to take over. Um, so there's, there's always hope and there's always a way to simplify, um, but it's more of a question of, you know, where is someone currently and how do you meet them there? Uh, and then from there, what can you do to keep things moving and keep them active? Great. I hope that answers Thank that. Yeah, definitely. Um, Dr. Haug, two questions. The first one's quick. Um, did you mention a specific candy or mint or gum at the beginning? Like, a, did you talk about a name of it? Uh, well, I said sugar free, uh, which is just so you don't get a bunch of cavities. Right. If you're doing this all day long, every day. Okay. Uh, and uh, sugar free lifesavers. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to make sure you didn't say a specific thing. Someone asked me, what was the time? So. You can get anything sugar-free gum or candy. Um, so the other question is, how much melatonin do you recommend? Um, I've heard that there are there's a situation if you take too much, it actually doesn't work at all, um, and the body's not absorbing. So what do you recommend to people, how they figure out what the right dosage is? Yeah, I haven't come across a paradoxical response where high doses start uh, 
not working when lower doses did, but it is true that there's a lot of interperson variability and not every treatment works for everyone. I'll usually recommend that somebody start with three milligrams every night, an hour or two before bed, and go up to as much as 10 milligrams. Okay, great. Oh, let me see, this was a longer question, so I had to write it down. Um, sorry. Uh, Okay, is it possible to have uh, this woman who has been having uh, issues for quite a while, um, she's been on medication for anxiety and depression, she hasn't improved, uh, she moves very slowly, but isn't stiff and doesn't have a tremor. Um, she drools and she sleeps 20 hours a day. Her psychiatrist doesn't think she needs to be tested for Parkinson's. Is it possible to have mood and cognitive changes without the physical symptoms? Um, she said her brother had did die from progressive supranocular palsy. palsy. Um, and so these mood changes kind of came on suddenly and she, she hasn't had any of that in the past. Is, what is, I know that there's so much more to know for that, but like, is that, a, is that connected? Um, in terms of like having all of those non-motor and symptoms. So I are and it, are you asking for I, me right now? I or feel like it's gonna end up being you could. yeah. But so in this case, um, I would be concerned that this may not be what we consider idiopathic Parkinson's disease because the combination of symptoms might mean there's something else going on. So um, I, I know in a minute, um, Dr. Haug is going to take this one, uh, but what I would recommend is this, this probably needs to have a more thorough, uh, a more thorough evaluation to determine if this is truly Parkinson's disease as we know it and as treated, or if this is one of the, what we would consider um, Parkinsonian syndromes that has, has features of Parkinson's and cognitive and mood. Great, yeah, Dr. Haug? Yeah, I, I think that some terminology may be useful here, which is Parkinsonism, which is kind of an umbrella category that means stiffness and slowness, maybe with tremor. About two thirds of Parkinsonism is due to Parkinson disease. Uh, but there are a handful of other conditions like the question mentioned, progressive supranuclear palsy, uh, they all have really long names, multiple system atrophy, corticobasal degeneration. Uh, those are all quite a bit less common, uh, but the constellation of symptoms mentioned in the question uh, certainly warrants evaluation by a neurologist or by a, a movement disorder specialist. Okay, great. Um, Dr. Mike, uh, should you exercise seven days a week? How important is it for people with Parkinson's to take a day off or are they the group that's better off, uh, you know, every day that they can exercise is a better day? You know, it's impossible to say this, but I heard a movement disorder doctor at, uh, at the Pan American Region Conference uh, in Miami say, try eight days a week. Um, <laughs> So at the same time though, there, there are such things as overuse injuries and there is such a thing as overdoing it, especially if you haven't been a lifelong exerciser, especially if it's been a while. Um, and that's why I think it's so important to vary your activity. Um, so, you know, you might have more of an active recovery day, for example, if you've a lot of people love boxing, for example. If you've had a hard boxing class one day, maybe the next day you do something like uh, a more uh, gentle walk or a walk with some stretching before and after or perhaps a yoga session. Um, more, if it's active recovery, probably more like yin yoga than something really intense where you're doing handstands and stuff. But, you know, everybody's a little different. So it, it's more a question of, What's your current fitness level? Are you overdoing it? And if so, perhaps there's a way to, without taking a full rest day, take a day to slow things down and practice some self-care. Because uh, variety, you know, there, too much anything can cause trouble in life. And variety with exercise is a very big deal. Great, thank you. 
Dr. Joanne uh, Hamilton, this is a sort of a practical question. And somebody asked, how do they, so their, their MDS is in a different state. Mm -hmm. Their neuropsych is in a different state. And how, how do you work with them? I think they're having some trouble with the communication piece and they're working together as a team because they're not part of a team. So right. how do you, what do you recommend for people who are in that situation? What are some practical things they can do in terms of communicating with both? And this is unfortunate because even though all of us keep stressing the importance of having this team approach when you're dealing with Parkinson's, in real life, um, that, that doesn't always happen. And sometimes you end up with practitioners who are not particularly good at reaching out to the rest of your treatment providers. So a couple of things. The first thing is to make sure that um, you have an explicit discussion with both providers um, and make sure that you sign consent to allow those two providers to talk. Uh, it, it's not enough just to make sure that that consent is in the medical file because they, they may not look at it. Um, you know, most of us use some sort of electronic medical record now, and that information could be buried at the very, very bottom. Um, then um, ask that the, two, that the two providers discuss your treatment plan with each other. And if that becomes problematic where, you know, one is saying, well, I've called three times and the other has never called back, suggest now that we have telehealth that you would like to do a case conference with both parties at the same time. And you'll need to schedule that appointment as if it was a regular medical evaluation. Um, and that might be helpful to get the ball rolling. Um, and then the squeaky wheel <laughs> is the saying that I like to use. So even if you're not the type of person that would normally call back a couple of times, in this situation, call back a couple of times. And at the very end, if you still can't get these two providers on the same page, consider asking one or the other if there's a provider that, that they work with more closely. Um, and, and that might help to get the team together. It, it's, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult thing. And I, I know this is a big problem in practicality. Yeah, right. Thank you very much. That's, that's super helpful. Uh, okay, Dr. Haug, this is uh, a couple of questions around COVID-19. Uh, the, the initial question, someone wanted to know, are they more likely to get it? But I, and I think that's important, but I think the bigger uh, issue here right now is that people are hearing from states and local authorities that things are starting to lift and be a little bit more flexible in terms of gathering and all of those kinds of things. But um, those might be more for the general public. What are you recommending to people with Parkinson's? What are you telling your patients about gathering, traveling, et cetera? And are you, uh, when, when, you know, when they're hearing all of these um, things being lifted, is that the same thing that you're telling them? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's so many unknown variables in this equation. And a lot of them are as unknown for me as they are for everyone else on this call. Uh, I think that as some of these shelter in place orders start to be lifted, there's gonna be, gonna be early adopters and middle adopters and late adopters. Uh, there's gonna be people who uh, kind of rush out and start doing as many normal things as they can. Uh, I think in terms of how much risk are people with Parkinson's at, uh, if your s symptoms are kind of mild or moderate, I think that your main risk factor is probably your age. So if you're 50 with moderate Parkinson's, your, symptom, your risk is probably similar to anyone else who's 50. But if you're either 85 with very mild Parkinson's or 60 with severe Parkinson's, maybe to the point where you're not taking as deep of breaths, you're not able to generate a forceful cough, I, I think that in that case, you're at a, a very high risk group if you were to contract the disease. Uh, so everyone will need to make their own decisions, but I'm encouraging my patients to kind of be on the uh, kind of late adopter of resuming as many normal activities as possible. Uh, you know, certainly you can kind of get back in that outside exposure, still continuing to wear a mask, uh, 
sooner rather than later. But in terms of going back to restaurants and, you know, kind of getting back into the normal life that we're all eager for, I think that if you're in a higher risk group, you should uh, see how things play out for another month or two. Great, thanks. And another, another question for you, uh, a few people have asked about the connection between like an autoimmune issue disease and Parkinson's. Are, is there a greater likelihood, let's say if you have lupus or something like that, that you would develop Parkinson's? Because a lot, you know, several people have talked about they have those and now they have Parkinson's. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think the, the short answer is there's not a big connection there that we know of uh, and that maybe somebody just has lupus and has Parkinson's. Uh, there are some of these diseases that are autoimmune, lupus or, or otherwise, where if the symptoms of that disease are poorly controlled enough that it can start to cause Parkinsonism, uh, kind of under that one third of the category that's not due to Parkinson's disease. But I would say for the most part, there's not uh, at this point a known strong connection between autoimmune diseases and Parkinson's. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to look through this real quick for people who um, wrote in during this time. I'm sorry, I was a little focused on Parkinson's case. Let's, um. Well, I did see some questions about the difference between dystonia and dyskinesia that uh, Dr. Okay. Howell might want to talk about. Great. Thanks, Joanne. Yeah, dystonia is kind of more of a fixed position. Like if your foot is turned in like this and it lasts 10 seconds or a minute or longer, that would be dystonia. Dyskinesia, as the term is typically used in Parkinson's, usually refers to medication-induced dyskinesias. And this is more of the wiggly, fidgety type of movements. It can be isolated to one area, like maybe you have some right arm, or left arm dyskinesia, uh, but dystonia tends to be more of a somewhat fixed movement, whereas dyskinesias are unpredictably fidgety and flowy movements. Great, thank you. Um, hi, Mike, you're on twice. Oh, you froze on the other one. Um, <laughs> so somebody asked about uh, specialty pharmacy meds, and I, I want to say that I'm hearing your question and I'm not ignoring it. Uh, but Dr. Haug is actually going to be doing a full webinar on Parkinson medications for motor symptoms. And we will be sure to share the information of when that's going to happen soon. Um, I think there's just so many medications that if we went down that path right now, we would uh, just have a, a lot longer uh, to go. But I want you to know that is, a, that is a session that's coming up. So we will be sure to talk to you about that. One final question I want to ask, because um, a few people have mentioned it, Dr. Haug. Um, the unintended weight loss and weight gain that comes with Parkinson's. Can you talk a little bit about what's happening and maybe a couple strategies that people can use? Yeah, it's interesting because it can go either way. I would say that in my practice, I often see more of the weight loss rather than weight gain. Where weight gain happens, it is sometimes due to a decreased level of physical activity or due to medication side effects, maybe with compulsive eating as a side effect of dopamine agonists or other medications. The weight loss is kind of incompletely understood. Some of it may be because if your motor symptoms aren't very well controlled, that the stiffness that you're fighting through with every movement just burns more calories. And there's a higher metabolic demand on your body all day long. And so you end up losing weight even if you're consuming the same amount of calories. Uh, with more progressed stages of the disease, people may not be eating as many calories because it takes longer to eat or because their swallowing is not as reliable as it used to be. Uh, and then lastly, if people are having dyskinesias, a lot of the wiggly fidgets as part of their medication treatment side effects, then that burns a lot of calories. It's kind of like being in a aerobics class part of the day. Uh, so those are some of the variables. If weight loss is a significant concern, then the typical strategy would be to try to eat more meals, more frequent smaller meals, add nutritional supplements like Boost or Insure uh, in between meals, basically try to increase the volume of calories throughout the day. Okay, 
Great, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Hamilton, Dr. Haug, Dr. Mike, for being here twice today for your uh, individual presentations and for being on the panel. I know it's uh, everybody's loving it, so thank you all so much. Yes, everybody's saying thank you. We wish we could have seen you in person for sure. Um, so hope to see you again, and maybe online, maybe not online. So thank you all so much for being here.